I want to thank the organizers of this uh, symposium, this workshop, for inviting me to talk about this body of work and um, that sets the stage for the rest of the presentations that are going to follow today. A number of colleagues and I on, on the Terrestrial Mammal Subcommittee led this. It was a two-year process. And um, it's uh, really the prelude to a, a number of assessments and reassessments that are taking place over the next few years. OK, everybody knows that um, it's clear to everybody that there's a great deal of variation within the species Rangifer tarandus. And um, understanding and classifying that variation has been a problem since the get-go. Um, there isn't any really good means of doing so in terms of uh, consistently applied and universally adopted. But the fact that there is that variation is known to anyone who spends any time with these animals. SARA, the Species at Risk Act in Canada, does actually embrace the notion, uh, similar to definitions of biological diversity, that there is diversity below the species level, and gives us essentially permission to do that, to, uh, to acknowledge that for a species, and to assess the status for those units separately. Um, but at the same time, uh, the species assessment process is only the beginning of a very large chain of events that's supposed to occur in the cycle of species at risk designation and recovery. Um, and it really is the job of the first part of this process, the species assessment process, which is undertaken by COSIWIC, to determine and to make a case for what units under species are important and are, um, you know, serve the goal of conservation, which is to maintain both the species, which is to maintain both the species and the variation within them. That is only the first stage of the process, and it, it isn't even the one that makes the listing decision. But it is the process that's supposed to look at these questions, both the status and that diversity question. Um, uh, from on, based on scientific grounds and with Aboriginal traditional knowledge as well. And so we named this thing, the very sexy name of designatable unit. And in, in, a, in a phrase, um, the, it is spatially, ecologically, or genetically discrete and evolutionary significant units underneath the species level. And so these are irreplaceable components of biodiversity. And so the notion is, is that if you identify those units, and you give them each a separate status, it is an acknowledgment of the fact that if one of those units or more of those units were to disappear, that would be a devastating loss to the diversity of that species. And so that is kind of the premise behind this. For those of you who are more familiar with applying the ESA in uh, the United States, uh, the parallel to that is the distinct population segment notion and also evolutionary significant units, which are both used within that legislation. Um, the definitions are quite similar, but we'll stick for the rest of the talk to DUs in Canada. So the designatable unit concept um, looks at these two uh, things, discreteness and significance. And significance doesn't get looked at until discreteness, and discreteness is not by itself uh, you know, a, a unit. And so when we're talking about things like discrete, we're talking about genetic distinctiveness, um, like through, which, which would be known through neutral genetic markers or inherited traits, natural range disjunctions, and the occupation of different ecological re regions that are actually relevant to that species. So those are kind of the types of things that will make a case for a unit being discrete. But it's not enough to be discrete. One must be significant as well. And the significance really talks about its role in the evolutionary legacy of the species. And so things like intraspecific phylogenetic divergence are very important. And then all in a unique ecological setting that might give rise to local adaptations, um, such that uh, you know, there are actually distinct and significant differences from between one unit and another within that same species. So this is kind of the framework. But then gathering the evidence for that is another matter entirely. I'm putting up these completely irrelevant maps, um, just because irrelevant from the standpoint that there's species that we're not talking about. We talked about kangaroos, let's talk about lions and other things. 
And it's really just to make the point that there is a difference. Um, the natural disjunction is very important for distinctness because um, if, the, uh, if the distinctiveness that emerges is a res as a result of human interference, i.e. human mediated uh, fragmentation of populations like, like the graph on the right, which they're historical remnants, that's not the same as um, you know, distinctness that arises from natural disjunctions. And the, the, the map at the left is a, is a sedge that is quite, um, no, it's a, I forget what species, sorry, I have to confess, that, that is really uh, very specialized to shed sedge habitats. This has been more or less the distribution. It's not a remnant of historical, but it's about that ecological specialization that has occurred. And that is why the pat that explains the pattern of disjunctness. So it's important that to make clear that those isolated populations, which we deal with a lot and we're going to deal with caribou, um, you know, just them being distinct all by themselves is not necessarily a reason for them to be significant as well. So one says, okay, so you know, this is very similar to the problem that we face with subspecies designations, and indeed there are times where uh, the subspecies designations that have happened do mirror the definition for the designable unit. But there are also times where they really do not. And that sometimes is because uh, those species, subspecies classifications were made a long time ago based entirely on um, the, uh, the uh, methodology of yesteryear when you're talking about taxonomic revisions and whatnot. Um, but then sometimes they are actually do hold out when you look uh, at other aspects that we're embracing within the definition of this DU concept, which relate to you know genetic divergence and whatnot, and and just I put a, a picture of the American badger um, distribution map, which um, is one that where we did just that we looked at um, how well the current genetic data actually upheld in rather old subspecies classification, and and it actually did in Canada that that is a is a good example of DUs. But more often than not, that work either hasn't been done or it's too old to just simply adopt subspecies classification. So it's not the same. So what about caribou? Well, when we entered into this exercise, um, you know, we're talking about one species with a circumpolar, large circumpolar range. But we do obviously know that it occupies, in Canada, a number of very, very different habitats, has different, displays different behaviors, looks different. And so embracing that uh, diversity is, is, um, is a challenging exercise. And indeed, there is, uh, as we all know, the subspecies classification. It hasn't died, but most people are not too happy with it. Some parts of it are pretty good. Other parts of it really don't hold true. But um, old classifications of caribou that, that were the foundation of COSIWIC assessments really did go by these subspecies classifications but nobody was very comfortable with that. So as a starting point, it wasn't, um, we did, couldn't embrace it wholeheartedly. There have also been attempts to look more at the notion of ecotype, where you've got populations that are adapted to a specific set of environmental conditions, which on the face of it almost sounds very similar to the DU definition. But there is no universally uh, regarded uh, embracing of any kind of concept of ecotype. The definition is, is, is not, um, the same uh, wherever you go, and there is no universally accepted one. So even though there's some truth to this scheme as well, they can be used as, a, as some, somewhat of a foundation is not the answer to what we're looking for. So what did we do in the past? I mean, it's worth looking to see what we did in the past and why we always change our mind. There have been two status assessments, uh, two reports of uh, essentially seven what used to be called nationally significant populations. That was the precursor to DU. And one was done in 2002, and it was uh, the woodland caribou subspecies, and it was broken down to several significant populations. And the other was Peary and Dolphin Union caribou. So at that time, the scheme was essentially, um, and th this map is actually, before I go into that, this map is actually to show that a number, of, a very large proportion of uh, the range has not been assessed at all. And, oh boy, I should have been listening when they said where it was, but. The, all that striped stuff up there, the barren ground populations, the Georgian leaf river herd in the northern uh, Ontario, and, and my 
and manitoba have never been assessed before. but of those that have been assessed the scheme was really looking at um subspecies first and then breaking that that down further. they did use the word ecotype but it was not used in the same way as the slide that i just showed you beforehand in this case it was used as um national ecological areas um and they were not necessarily ah relevant to caribou. and so where that is comes out mostly is in the mountain area where southern and northern mountain caribou were part of the same subspecies but they were subdivided further based on this line which was the national ecological area distinction between northern and southern mountain this has as any bc caribou biologist will tell you brought about fairly significant kind of confusing problems since then because it's not a line that's particularly relevant to caribou and so this is a lot of the impetus of the exercise of sort of redoing this and moving forward this is a typical table of contents of a coceric report and the designatable unit is but one section and normally that assessment and that evaluation of designatable unit is done in the context of the status report it's not that complicated all the time and even when it is you know they might take eight pages to do it it um rather than a huge tree size which is what we ended up doing um we decided be on that basis because it would be so complicated and because up until present nobody had ever looked at the entire species in canada um instead it sort of take removed bits of it um and justify that those as du's and then move forward with lots part of the range never assessed and so we decided to take that part of the status report out and do a con do a, a concerted effort just on that try to look at the evidence for designatable unit uh, breakdown across canada and um, proceed on that basis and indeed we have another sexy cover and uh, the report is posted on the web as of december 2011 and um this report which is quite hefty really goes through all of the of the available evidence to try and make a case for the structure which we came out which looks essentially like this and i'll go through a little bit later how it has changed not from uh, the previous designation but um, more importantly we have uh, 11 extant du's and one extinct du being the dawson um, dawson's caribou number 12 out on the west coast there on the from former uh sorry <clears throat> on the former uh, Haida Islands, uh, on, on the present Haida Islands. And so this right now is the, um, the structure that we're working with. And I'm going to just give you a bit of an overview of the rationale. I'm not going to go into differences between each one to the, to the extent that that's important for the stories that are going to follow this. The authors of those talks will perhaps spend a little bit of time on that or not. Um, but this is in the, the scheme that we have adopted that will go into the assessment process. The process was we did ask for a contract on there. It went to Laura Finnegan and her colleagues at Trent University, who slaved away for a better part of a year and a half to uh, get feedback from jurisdictions, um, other caribou biologists, and uh, comb through the enormous volume of information that was available. It, like all status reports, um, went through the same level of review, if not more. There were two what we call jurisdictional review periods, which was also a time when it was brought forward to some independent uh, caribou experts at the same time. Wildlife management boards looked at it, and um, extensive consultation. So probably more than 100 people participated in the peer review process. It was stewarded by the Terrestrial Mammal Subcommittee, and then the scheme was presented to COSELIC and adopted um, in December 12. And that basically set, put in motion the assessments and reassessments that are taking place from that time. Um, but obviously, there, there could be, even with new information during that process, there could, it could be subject to, to tweakage. One doesn't know what will follow with new information. But at least stood us on solid ground that we could um, we could uh, proceed with these assessments and reassessments um, on that kind of basis. Now, we all know that the building blocks of management are the population or herd level. And, uh, you know, for better or worse, these are delineated in much part of the range. And management um, focus is often or almost always on these populations. And so, ideally, we would have liked to actually start from the bottom up rather than be. 
um, uh, you know, held to the previous scheme and, 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 um, from the and go from the top down. The bottom up would have been great to be able to have each population look at the neighboring ones and, and so on and so on, have a big huge matrix, we have visions of that. But the information just isn't there. There are two, more, many more populations that have zero information than those that have a lot. And so it proved to be impossible to be able to do it from the bottom up. And so instead, we really had to go through natural groupings of neighboring populations and, and sort of start with those new and great, uh, new known groupings that we were comfortable, that was sort of a hodgepodge of kind of ecotypes and subspecies and other recognizable units, and then proceed through there. And so we used five lines of evidence that we'll talk about in a second, and then examined each one in a fairly formalized way for discreteness and significance in these groupings, both between them and among them, under them, that kind of thing. So the caribou DU decisions were made on multiple lines of evidence. We didn't have a rule set. If there's this number of evidence, then um, it will be a DU. It was really um, looking at all the available and, and seeing where the weight of evidence looked to. I mean, we were never 100% sure about a lot of these things because there are gray areas and there is contradictory evidence. But we did set it up in such a way that we were able to look at various criteria, both discreteness and significant, and look at what the evidence would show us on these kinds of things. And some, like phylogenetics and movements and behavior, and to some extent geographic distribution, were quite important in this picture. Other, other types of evidence, like morphology, and even genetic diversity and structure, were actually um, more supporting evidence than, than um, really the smoking gun on some of these. Um, so these were really how we set that up. Um, but also something very important is because Kosiewicz does not think about consequences of those designations, we did not look at um, the relative threat of these various units. And I'll go into that a little bit more as to why that might be tempting to do and why, why we didn't do that. But that's important that this were really based on the, um, the criteria as outlined uh, within the Kosiewicz DU definition. This was a complex, challenging exercise. We're talking about an enormously vast area, lots of uh, differences that look to some to be profound and significant and others not so much. The relatively small amount of data that answers these particular questions, particularly since you're look, taking a comparative view across the country, you could compare perhaps two units at a time, but you couldn't compare the other units at the same time in a lot of these traits uh, that we're talking about, a lot of the lines of evidence. And um, so those studies that looked at these variations were tended to be limited in scope, but that was the reality. There still was a lot of information, but whether it was relevant for this exercise was, was always, um, uh, always in question. And then some populations, and this is the George River herd, were very, very well known, uh, m but most have had no data taken from them at all. And so um, when you're really looking to see what down at the population or herd level, what gets assigned to what, uh, you run into these kinds of challenges. And a case in point are genetic studies that feed into this. I mean, we had issues, if you look at the maps on the right, I mean, the, you know, when you're not asking the question of de designated units, it's difficult then to re retrofit genetic evidence to get what you need. And some of, it, some of it is hampering of sampling design because you'll have a sampling scheme that really only uh, does part of the range um, and, or, and or has very small sample sizes at other parts of the range. This is hopefully being rectified uh, with larger studies um, now, but not wasn't in time for this exercise. There's also the issue of what kinds of the methodology in the study, um, issues of design, misassignments, and then the whole notion of differenti uh, genetic differentiation uh, was challenged by some of the, these very isolated populations that have become isolated in southern Canada in particular, or even Piri Caribou in the far north that have become isolated and genetically differentiated, but not necessarily as a result of natural processes that have happened. And so these kinds of evidence to be able to sift through that and understand what that means from the point of view of discreteness and significance as I've described it was not so easy and we went through quite a lot of pain on that. One thing that was um, uh, quite helpful was the phylogenetic history and some of these lineages, these two lineages that have, um, in particular, that reflect um, the recolonization of caribou um, after the ice sheets passed. But of course, there's some challenges with that too, particularly where 
um, the two met um, in, in the south, southern Rocky Mountains and elsewhere. But this did give us um, a quite a lot of information in terms of being able to classify these um, uh, these species, uh, sorry, these units in terms of their significance, and also actually uh, to show that some of a good portion of Banfield's uh, designation actually made uh, some sense. Um, and so, not the whole thing, but but some portions of it absolutely did. Movements and behavior did seem did turn out to be very important because they are. Uh, very likely manifestations of local adaptations that have arisen t through time due to distinct and significant ecological settings. And so we played around with this a lot, but really wanted to look at uh, whether or not these particular traits would have something to do with evolutionarily, um, uh, have something to do with inherited traits or not. And that's always very difficult to infer. And so some of what we uh, really looked at is this aggregated versus dispersed calving and thinking that, that during that time of year that really does have much relation to fitness, individual fitness, and so that that dispersion or aggregation of calves would be assumed to be inherited traits, a lot of which could be explained by some of the different pieces of geography where these caribou dwell. And then our other challenge related to more um, some of these, where they are in terms of geography. And we looked at their distribution in terms of range overlap, uh, whether or not there was natural dysfunction and occurrence to ecoregions and whether that was meaningful for caribou. But we've got the challenge of, of there being overlap between some of these ecotypes in certain parts of the year, um, particularly winter. And so that didn't bug us too much because we were really trying to avoid overlap during uh, the times of year where there was most possibility for genetic exchange, which, which would not be winter. And so we, we still were um, fairly confident about assigning those as discrete status. Um, this table is just the table, a summary table of kind of the answers of where we came up with. And we're not to look at any details, but just to show that for each of these DUs where we ended up, um, we really were looking at uh, um, trying to get X's in both sides, and, and, and not just one, but a couple. And X's were where we thought the information, this records where the information was quite supportive of either discreteness on the one side or significance on the other, and significance on the other side. They really need to have the and in there. Um, but there were also lots of places where either there was no evidence or the, or the preponderance of evidence that existed could not support it, or zeros where there was no evidence at all. Um, and then some where there seemed to be a little bit of evidence, that's the pluses there. So that's the kind of table we ended up with. We didn't go through any quantitative rigorous exercise in terms, in terms of turning that into um, the answers, but really used our own uh, opinions and where the weight of evidence was looking as to what um, what this would be. We, th what this table does not reflect is a considerable scrutiny that we did underneath each of these DUs and the ones that we decided were out of the question um, and did not qualify. We did not record that in the table. These are the DUs that we ended up with. And there is the map again. And I have three minutes. Um, so uncertainties um, that exist, we've got um, uh, did not have a formal process for bringing in Aboriginal no traditional knowledge, but those of us with experience know that the acknowledgement of different kinds of caribou cavorting in the same landscape is not an uncommon thing at all. And so that hopefully will come in with a status assessment. In terms of DU boundaries, while we use populations as boundaries, um, they, they, we have the issue of them being overlapping, and then some herd assignments that we could not make because there was absolutely no information on there. There are knowledge gaps, over the range, and one huge knowledge gap relates to male movements and male-mediated dispersal that might occur. Um, I want to say again that cosmic assessment is the very first stage of the process, and, and a very small one, and a very isolated one, and we go about our business as the recovery machine kind of turns or doesn't turn. And so where the consequences of that are that we are now in, uh, embarking on reassessments of some species for which there isn't even, uh, some units for which there isn't even a recovery plan. And uh, that's the case for boreal caribou, although that's being finalized pretty soon. And uh, southern mountain caribou have never had a recovery plan. The process is just getting underway. But we are already engaged in the reassessment. Um, the other thing that is challenging is that when you start thinking about management of this, if we have one unit that 
um, that melds together many populations that can be deeply unsatisfying from a management perspective because some populations are doing better than others. And so, for example, right now there's quite a lot of concern on Baffin Island, but if that gets diluted into a status assessment of barren ground across the way, how will that make the case that these guys are in trouble? But that's, that's a challenge, but it is the first part of the stage and it's not meant to be what, where the management is. The other challenge is not worrying about threats. And that's not what we're allowed to do. We cannot look at consequences of this. And plus, it would lead often to a real reductionist approach where you would be tempted to put, carve across a lot of units due to their threatened status. It is confusing because David Green did write an article about uh, DUs back in, that was published in Conservation Biology in 2005 that really did um, uh, say, gave, give a blessing to looking at conservation status of neighboring DUs, but that is not the case anymore. And where that comes into play, for example, is we just assessed grizzly bear, and there, for reasons I'm not going to get into, there's no case to be made for the western um, portion of that range to be classified as more than one DU. But everybody knows that the conservation picture for these guys down here is starkly different from up here at the moment. And so you'll have, a, you know, we came up with a, a status assessment for a very large population a unit of, of special concern, which again, feels very dissatisfying from a management perspective, particularly for those jurisdictions that don't have Endangered Species Acts themselves. And so this is a consequence of some of this, um, of the DU, and so I wanted to make the point that the assessment is very, very different from, from that management part of the equation. Um, just one more thing, uh, just to let you guys know that in terms of the proposed DU status, really the only, this shows in different colors uh, which ones have been assessed previously and where the DU structure has not changed, which is all the yellow. And the purple mountain hertz have been changed enormously, and Deb will talk about that in the next talk. And then this large area here has never been assessed. We are going through that process right now. We had the first batch of two status reports in January, and we're about to put out the bid for the second batch of status reports next month.